Now, what you're being told is this, that in the beginning, there was gas. And then that gas collapsed under the force of gravity and began to swirl around. From the gas, grains of dust condensed. The dust then stuck together to become little rocks. The little rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks. The bigger rocks stuck together to become what are called planetesimals, which means asteroids. The word means little planets, but asteroids, basically. And then the asteroids stuck together in various ways to become the planets we see. Now, you'll be told in the textbooks and science programs and all the rest of it that this is how it all got here. Minor detail, though, is that the model doesn't actually work. You can get dust from gas, and you can get dust to stick together. Just look under your furniture for proof of that, right? But what you don't get is rocks beyond about this big. When the rocks get to be about this big, they have enough mass to start breaking each other apart as they collide. I mean, these things are going thousands of miles an hour. So imagine smashing boulders together thousands of miles an hour. Do you get bigger boulders as a result of that, or do you get rubble? You get rubble. But at this size, there's not enough mass there to have enough gravity to pull the rubble together to make bigger things. So enough mass to be destructive, not enough mass to overcome that with constructive gravity. And so this is where formation stops, this size right here. Now, do they know that they have this problem in their models? Well, yes, of course they do. I'm quoting them. How do they get around this? Well, they've been struggling with this for a long time now because this is basic physics here. I mean, you know, rocks traveling thousands of miles an hour make little rocks, not big ones. So the currently, current favorite explanation is that, as this quote says, objects must have grown very rapidly from sub-meter sized pebbles into 100 kilometer sized bodies, possibly in a single leap. In other words, rocks this big turned into rocks the size of Rhode Island without passing through intermediate stages and sizes. Is this a scientific model? Or is this a bunch of hand waving to paper over some big problems in the model? You know, the best thing about God of the Gap arguments is that eventually science is going to fill in the gap and it's just going to make the creationists look stupid. In this case, not only has science already filled in the gap, but the very, you know, the, the texts, the papers that he quotes from are the very papers that have solved this problem that he talks about. And it's a, a sort of well-known problem in planetary formation. So, but, so I'm going to describe what the solution to this problem is, and then I'm going, but let's first sort of look, do a sort of overview of how planets form. Okay, now... Planets form at the same time that stars do as part of the star formation process. So you start with a gas cloud, which is um, the, the type of clouds that collapse directly into stars are called dense cores. And they have a diameter of about 0.3 light years. Okay, Now they're going to radiate energy, and they're going to uh, become gravitationally unstable and collapse. Now they're, they're not going to just collapse directly into a star a lot of the mass will collapse directly into the star. But because of conservation of angular momentum, a lot of the gas forms a disk. Okay, now this disk is about 140 astronomical units across on average. Okay, now the disk is flared, which means that the farther away you are from the star, this is a cross section of the disk, okay? The disk is in the plane of the uh, viewer. But the farther away you are from the star, the thicker it is. Okay. Now, the disk forms because of conservation of angular momentum. So this, in this cloud, in the original gas cloud, each piece of the gas is moving at its own speed and therefore has its own angular momentum. And then when it collapses, if, it, if, if, it, if each piece were to conserve its angular momentum, then the pieces with the lowest angular momentum would go into the protostar. And then the higher the angular momentum a piece of gas had, the farther it would be, it would settle in the disk. So both the dense core and the disk have dust grains. It's a gas in a dust disk. Okay? And the dust grains grow by coagulation, which is just they stick together. So you start with, in the interstellar medium, dust grains have radius of about a micrometer or less. And when you, when you concentrate them into the disk, they're going to settle, the dust grains are going to settle into the disk midplane so that the disk, the dust disk is actually thin. And then they're going to stick together. 
they're going to coagulate into larger objects. So you start with micrometer sized dust grains, they stick together to make whatever, and they keep sticking together until you have something like a centimeter or ten centimeter wide object. I guess it wouldn't be called a dust grain. And then there's a problem. Because we're trying to explain the formation of planets from dust grains, basically. And so, when people first started doing this, when people first started studying this, they could not get from these objects, 10 centimeter objects, to what would, the much larger objects that you would call planetesimals. Objects that are large enough that they have their own gravitational pull. That's, a, that's important. So these are way too small to have their own gravitational pull. And so the problem is that for these for small dust grains, the electrostatic forces, like the usual chemical bonds, Van der Waals forces, whatever, they make the grain stick together. And that works well on sizes less than a centimeter. But once you get to a centimeter and higher, the electrostatic forces between two objects are not that strong. I mean, we know that from everyday life because if you take two centimeter sized objects and push them together, they'll bounce apart because the forces between them are not strong enough to hold them together. The, the Van der Waals forces, the whatever. So if you take two centimeter sized objects, collide, they just bounce apart. Or if they're moving relative to each other, and then the, the, if they have a high relative velocity, then they might shatter into pieces, as Spike said. And also, you have this problem that if you have an object that's a meter sized, then it's going to spiral into the um, star. And the reason is because the dust and the gas are orbiting the star at different speeds. So, a, a solid like a dust a dust particle or a meteor or an asteroid, it goes around the star and it goes around at such a speed that the outward centrifugal force due to the circular motion is exactly balanced by the inward gravitational force to the protostar. So the, the dust particles are moving at what's called Keplerian speed. It's just you know, Kepler's laws of, of motion. So they, they're moving at the speed that would be predicted from Kepler's laws of motion. The gas is moving slower, and that's because in addition to the gas is, is or each piece of gas is orbiting the star, so it has a centrifugal force that points outward, but there's also a pressure, a hydrostatic pressure force, because the pressure in the disk, when you get near the star, the pressure is high, and the pressure decreases as you get away from the star because of you know temperature density. So there's an outward pressure gradient force. So the, the gas does not have to go as fast. It does not have to orbit the star as fast as the dust does in order to, to be in equilibrium. Because the, the gas has both a pressure gradient force that points outward and the um, centrifugal force. While the, while the dust only has a centrifugal force. So that means that the grains are orbiting faster than the gas. So, uh, so if the well, the I guess it would be better to say that the if if you wanted a grain to be in a stable orbit, it would have to be moving faster than the gas at that particular point. So that means that from the grain's point of view, it's moving through the gas. So the gas is slowing it down, and therefore, if you're if it loses energy from this friction, it's gonna it's just gonna keep losing energy and spiral into the star. Okay, and so Spike says, Spike Psyrup, whatever his last name is, <clears throat> Spike Pissaris, says that this, you know, this is a horrible problem with the secular model of how planets form, and it's insurmountable. And then he, he sort of laughs at the solution, which he says is, you know, he, 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 he reads this quote from a paper, and he says something like, uh, the magically, he, he makes it seem like the explanation is magic. Like astronomers think that the centimeter size objects just magically turn into hundred kilometer size objects. 
Now, of course, it's not it's not magic. There's a lot of physics involved. So let's let me explain the solution to the problem. The solution of how do you get from um, centimeter-sized objects to planetesimals, which are kilometers, hundred kilometers across, okay, and how do the planetesimals grow into planets? So now. Um, the solution involves something called the streaming instability. So now imagine that we're looking, so here's a cross section of the disk, we're looking at it edge on. But now imagine that you're looking down at the disk, the protostars at the center, the, the blue represents the gas part of the disk, and then the little green dots are the dust particles. Okay, so, you know, the whole thing is rotating or uh, revolving around the central star, and because the dust grains are moving faster than the gas, or would have to be moving faster than the gas to be in a stable orbit, each dust grain is, is slowly spiraling closer and closer to the star. Now, the distribution of dust grains is not going to be perfectly uniform. There could be a variety of reasons for this. Um, turbulence, for example. In turbulence, random velocity fluctuations, would sort the would sort of imprint onto the dust distribution random density fluctuations so that some regions of the disk would have a higher density than average of dust and others would have a lower density. And then as the as the disk rotates it would stretch any perturbation into basically a ring, a ring of higher density where the dust density is higher than, than average. All right, so let's imagine that we're, we have this little ring where the, the, where the density of grains is higher than average. As, and, then the, and then remember, the, the, for, for the grains to have a stable orbit, they have to move faster than the gas. So the gas is uh, exerting a drag force on the grains and slowing it down. But here's the thing. According to Newton's third law, every force... Every object that exerts a force, if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B has to exert an equal and opposite force on object A. So if the grain, if the gas is exerting a force on the grains, making them slow down, then the grains also have to be exerting a force on the gas, making it speed up. So in this, in this particular region of space, or at this particular radius where there's a higher concentration of grains than usual, there's going to be, the, the grains are going to be exerting a f force on the gas, making the gas speed up, because the gas is slowing, the gas is moving slower than the grains. So if the grains exert a force on the gas, then the gas speeds up, and since there's more grains at, the, at this particular radius, that this effect of the gas speed, of the grains speeding the gas up, is going to be maximized at this radius. Now, what that means, though, is that if 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 the gas speeds up, then the then the the relative speed between the gas and the dust decreases. So the if 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 the gas speeds up, that means that the 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 force, the drag force, by the gas on the grains decreases. So. This effect of making the gas speed up closer to the speed that the grain's going means that in this ring, all of the grains in this ring will be spiraling inward much slower than you would think because of that effect. Because they're speeding the gas up and they're, they're decreasing the, the gas pressure, the, the drag. But all of these dust grains out here are still spiraling into the towards the center at the same rate as usual because there's not enough grains to speed the gas up. So what happens is you have you have this region this this particular radius where the drag force has been significantly reduced and therefore this these grains are barely moving inwards. But then you have all these grains out here which are moving inward rapidly. And so the, a particular grain out here is going to spiral in towards the star and then it's going to intersect this radius. And then once it becomes part of this radius, 
Well, it, it's, it gets part of the, it, it gets to a place where the drag force has been re reduced, and so it piles up. And the more dust grains you have in this, at this particular radius, which is slowly contracting, the more dust grains you have, the more the gas is forced to flow at a speed that's closer to the, the dust speed. So, you know, the more dust grains you have, the more, you know, force, the, the more force there is on the gas to make the gas flow at the same speed as the dust. So this, this, um, this sort of ring of high density particles is slowly contracting because there's still some friction, but it's, it's contracting, it's contracting at a slower and slower and slower rate as it gains more and more mass of, in the form of dust. Eventually, the density of dust in this ring is going to be so high that the gravitational effect of the, of course, each dust grain, the gravitational field is weak. But if you collect enough dust particles, then the, then the combined gravitational effect, the, the combined gravitational field of all the particles is going to become non-negligible. And so then what's going to happen is, is this, this ring is basically going to collapse. Um, uh, well, once the, once the gravitational field from the mass in the ring becomes greater than, say, the gravitational field from the star or the pressure or whatever, other forces there are, then it's then it's going to coalesce into a single object. And basically, you can imagine that it, just like the density in the radial direction is um, not uniform, you, even the density within the ring is not uniform. If you, and if you take the, the highest density region, it's going to sort of collapse because of gravity, and then then that collapse region is as the as this collapse thing moves around the disk, it's going to pull in all the other particles in the ring, and so you're going to get this sort of cluster of particles, cluster of dust grains that are um, that that's a cluster that's, that's that's orbiting the star. Now, this is not a planetesimal yet because it's. You have a bunch of particles that are moving around within the gravitational field of the combined particles. And for this to become a planetesimal, these particles have to lose all of their kinetic energy so that they coalesce into a single object. Okay, and they lose energy because of basically two processes. There's still gas here, so as the particles move around, the f gas friction slows them down. And then also, they, they collide, and during the collisions, there's heat generated, so some of the kinetic energy is lost as heat, and some of the kinetic energy is, goes into deforming, and breaking them up and stuff. So gradually, this object, this swarm of dust grains, coalesces into a single object, which is a planetesimal. Okay, and simulations show that this can be like 100 kilometers across. So, you know... <laughs> Spike Cirrus makes it seem like magic to go from something that's one centimeter across to something that's a hundred kilometers across. But it's not magic. It, there's some physics to how it happens. Anyway, once you have the plant, so that's how planetesimals form from dust grains, okay? And so this will happen over and over again, all right, as density fluctuations are amplified by this streaming instability and you get the planetesimals. And so you, you'll end up with a bunch of planetesimals. And then the planetesimals collide with each other to grow into what are called planetary embryos, okay? And then eventually, you know, the planetary embryos could collide and you get planets. And actually, this is sort of a simplification because the, this is how the rocky planets form. And if, if, you, if you take into account the, um, the giant planets, then it gets a little more complicated. But I, I think the point is, is that this is not really an insurmountable problem. Going from 10 centimeter rocks to 100 kilometer rocks is not the insurmountable problem that Spike Sarsaris says it is. Okay.